A very good evening to you and a warm welcome to Galaxy Prime. Thank you so much for joining us on this Monday evening and for choosing Galaxy Universal Network. It's such a pleasure to be in your company once again on this Monday. Here's hoping you had a fantastic weekend. My name is Audrey Chimwanda Twala. We'll take a look at stories not only from South Africa, but across the continent to all our viewers that are joining us also from across the continent. We welcome you to the program. We'll take a look at our top stories now. In our headlines, a former SA police minister gives testimony at the Zone Commission and an internet blackout after Somalia Prime Minister is removed and uh, ousted uh, President seeks re-election in uh, Central African Republic. Also back home in South Africa, economic recovery plan. What is going on? What is the President's plan? What is his Cabinet's plan? We'll be also taking a look at that. And uh, we'll also look at a Zambian Member of Parliament uh, with HIV who tests uh, COVID-19 positive and how she is handling that. Now to start off uh, our program today, joining me in studio is Mr. Machela Koko. He's the former CEO of uh, ESCOM. To some of our viewers from across the continent who may not be familiar with what ESCOM is, it is the South African Electricity uh, Public Utility. He recently wrote an opinion piece and uh, we'll be analyzing it and to find out uh, what exactly he was alluding to and some of the uh, relevant points that he raised in that opinion piece uh, going forward. I know some of you here in South Africa have been experiencing blackouts and it's been quite an inconvenience um, uh, within the past couple of weeks we'll try to understand why that is so and why we're experiencing that at the moment uh, mr Koko, thank you so much for joining us good evening to you good evening Audrey, and good evening to your listeners right now you wrote an article uh, recently how is escom kept out of the renewable energy program in favor of uh, independent power producers the issue of ipps has been raging for a couple of years now what uh, prompted you to write this article and what was your motive I have, in my past life, been the group executive of ESCO. I am now running a company called Machela Energy that has got presence in the region. And my preoccupation is really about energy poverty that me and you and others must work together to deal with. Mm. There's over 500 million people in the region that do not have access to electricity. And that cannot continue like that. It's, a, it's, it's an indictment on me and you, particularly Africans that can solve this problem. I have the pleasure of being trained by ESCOM. Now, South Africa is in a unique situation. If you cross the border, they have generation problem. They do not have the capacity to generate the electricity they need. South Africa is in a unique situation. We have more capacity than we need. But electricity availability still constrain the, constrains the economy. And I think it's wrong. And, uh, can you try and make it make sense for us when you say we've got the capacity, but we're still experiencing load shedding? How does, how does that happen? So South Africa has a minimum, and I'm saying a minimum because mm -hmm. I know it's got more, but let's say a minimum of 45,000 megawatts of capacity, of generation capacity available under ESCOM. Mm. Um, ESCOM has a strategy which they call 80-10-10, which basically simply means that at a point in time, 20% of it must be unavailable, 10% of that on maintenance and the balance breakdowns. So if you say 20% of the 45,000 megawatts is unavailable, it means 9,000 megawatts is unavailable of the 45,000 megawatts. You are left with 34,000 megawatts to keep the lights on. Your peak demand is 32,000 megawatts. On top of that, you still have what many do not know of 2,000 megawatts of reserves from the smelters that are available within a minute. Mm. So you've got 34,000 megawatts that should be available at any point in time, plus 2,000 megawatts of emergency reserves with the smelters your peak demand is 32,000. So you've got f close to 4,000 surplus capacity, but you still load shed. Mm. The biggest people who suffer is your key customers, what we call um, uh, key customers, the mines and the manufacturers. 
at, at any point in time when the system is artificially constrained, and that's the word I use, because I think we are artificially constraining the electricity supply and impacting the economy negatively. You, the, you, before you load shed, before you go to stage one or you go into stage two, mm -hmm. you take 20% of the consumption in the mines off. Mm. Now, if you are running a gold mine, a gold mine close to 40% of their OPEX is electricity. And if you take 20%, you are killing these mines. It is no coincidence, right. it is no coincidence that ESCOM sales volumes are declining by 1% year on year. Because the ESCOM customer base is increasing, and the only reason the ESCOM customer base is increasing is because ESCOM is electrifying more residential houses. Yes. But the mining and manufacturing consumption is declining mm. for two reasons. Because of that 20% that ESCOM continuously takes away from them because the system is artificially constrained. But secondly, because of load shedding. Now, so, so ESCOM is getting more customers in terms of the residential base yes. instead of the industrial yes, side. Which don't pay. Which don't pay ESCOM. <laughs> well. As they're owing yeah. ESCOM close to 30 billion rands. So you, ESCOM is electrifying more, mm. and that's the right thing. Uh, the constitutionally, the people must have access to electricity, and they must pay for it. And those that cannot afford, in other words, the indigent, mm -hmm. constitutionally there's a dispensation for them. So they're catered for. But uh, they don't, the municipalities don't pay. But, but the ANC government has come up with another part. It, in its frustrations, mm -hmm. uh, and I understand the frustrations because you are a government that has got uh, more than so available capacity to keep the lights on, but you continue to load shed the smelter, the mines, and the manufacturing. So what do you do? So the government has decided that we're not going to, as a country, going to we're no longer going to put our eggs in one basket called ESCOM. We're going to diversify going into to other markets. We're going to diversify and let the independent power producers share the load with ESCOM. Ordinarily, that's not a problem. But that must be done at a cost and pace that me and you mm. can afford. Right. So me and you can have this conversation in studio yes. and speak of independent power <coughs> producers, but the person who's sitting at home may not understand exactly what that is. And I think that has been the problem with most South, South Africans who just wake up one morning and uh, there's load shedding and they're told there's this issue of IPPs. What is this animal that is called IPP? Why is it important to partner with it, if at all it is? public-private partnerships for the provision of electricity, for the provision of water, given that the government is constrained, the fiscal is, is constrained, it's, it's perfectly right. We need, to, we need to share the burden of keeping the lights on with the private sector. Mm. And government has done that since 2011, and they've gone about it in a very, very wrong way. So right now we have independent power to produce us as private players that generates electricity that sells to ESCOM and ESCOM sells it to me and you. Yeah. And there's 5,000 megawatts of that contracted already and more has been built. It's coming at a cost of 235 cents per kilowatt hour. ESCOM buys it from them. At that much? At that much, 235 cents. Um, in dollar terms, you, you, you Pub, you, you broadcast globally is around, I would say, 14, say 14 US cents. But you sell it to me and you at 90 cents. And ESCOM can produce it at 40 cents. So what ESCOM can produce at 40 cents, it buys it at 235 cents, and it sells it at 90 cents. That's not good enough. That obviously is not making sense. Uh, it that it, 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 not it, sense it, to any lay person who could it be listening it and it trying it to it figure it out how those figures would then come together. It does not make sense. The people that pushes it say 
But ESCOM should not worry because me and you pay. So that's supposed to make it better. But it doesn't make it better. You understand? So people will say, but it's a cost pass through. It still does not stop the fact that ESCOM is buying, it's available at 2 35 cents mm. to ESCOM. Yes. And ESCOM is selling it at 90 cents for what ESCOM can produce at 40 cents. So that, 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 that does not make but sense. But what is the motivation behind that line of thinking, do you think? I mean, you've worked um, at uh, the <coughs> highest level of, of, of ESCOM. It's the consequences of what we call the Integrated Resource Plan of 2010. At that point, we, we, we wanted, we came from France, COP17, if you remember it. Yes. And we, were co we, we committed ourselves to decarbonizing the electricity sector. Wind and solar at that point were not the least cost option, were not cheap. We took strategic decision at that point that we have to decarbonize and we have to support technologies that would otherwise not play because they're too expensive. And we have to cushion them and protect them and make what we call a policy decision. Mm -hmm. A policy decision is a decision that says, this thing is not cheap. It will, it will ordinarily not be deployed. But we're looking at a 50-year window. That's how you plan in electricity. And one of my frustrations about what we're doing now is that we don't look at a 50-year window when the apartheid government looked at the 50-year window. So we deployed them and they were not cheap. At that point, coal, coal and nuclear were cheap. So we deployed them there. But what we failed to do is to self-correct. Mm. We, we failed to accept that the decision we made in 2011 uh, has got consequences that we, did not, uh, that we did not anticipate then. Uh, but one. But secondly, which is the elephant in the room, the, the renewable energy lobby group, both locally and internationally, is extremely powerful. And I think that the government of the day um, is unable to say no to them. Because they're powerful? Because they're extremely powerful. Because it just does not make sense. And, and, and you, you refer to my opinion piece. Correct. I'm saying if, if, the if ESCOM sales volume are declining by 1% year on year, mm -hmm. Any business person will tell you that when you run a business and its sales are declining, that's not where you put your money. Why would, if you are a sensible businessman, why would you take money, your money, and invest it in a business like that's ESCOM exciting. that's got a declining sales volume? You will hear a lot of talk from COSATU that says use the pension funds to bail out ESCOM. It's wrong. Because whether you're an equity investor mm -hmm. or a, you, you lend ESCOM money, you borrow ESCOM money, you want your money back. You can only get your money back when ESCOM sales go up. But ESCOM sales are declining. So whether you take ESCOM uh, pensions money there or you, somebody uh, gives you money in the form of debt, mm -hmm. he's not going to get it back. Mm. So ESCOM is a bottomless pit of money, whether it comes from the banks or from the lenders or from uh, 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 in pension funds. That money is not going to come back because ESCOM sales are not growing. ESCOM sales are declining. If you, if you studied MBA, you'll see, you'll remember the, the concept like the dog. ESCOM is a dog. It's not a star. If you remember the BCG yes, curve, yes, it's, it's yes. a dog. It's dying. The sales are going down. Mm. Every year, next year, ESCOM sales volume will be 1% less than this year. And this is going to be consistent every and, year that and comes. And this is going to be consistent every year. And the reason for that is because government has decided that because the mines are taking pain out of load shedding, they can generate for themselves. They are the key customers. Secondly, government has also decided that 
municipalities that can afford, now mark the words afford, mm -hmm. can generate, can buy from the independent power producers. What will be left from ESCOM is municipalities that cannot afford, that cannot pay. Mm. One, two, ESCOM will be left with less customers so that f their revenue can only decline. The way ESCOM is going about it, because ESCOM does not have the proverbial balls to say to its, to say to its sales shareholders, no. One of the best persons that I worked for was Brian Molefe, mm. uh, uh, because Brian would not tolerate that. Brian will put an ESCOM hat and he will say, not under my watch will I manage a business with declining sales. He very astute businessman that I worked for. Mm. But these guys, all what they can do when they realize it's tough, they run. And, and speaking of that, I'm sure you're aware of us, Viso Dabe yeah. was the, uh, exiting the ESCOM and board. Will What's run. your reaction to that? He, he can only run and more will run. Because once you go into the ESCOM boardroom, mm. then you realize what that the whole concept of tape capture was a ruse, was a false route. But apparently he was brought in to clean up state-owned enterprises that uh, have uh, been uh, captured. Uh, uh, this is what we were told. I will come, I'll come back to that. Mm -hmm. But let's, let me f finish. I want to right. come back to that okay. because I was, the dad, I, was direct, yes. I was directly involved. Um, I was uh, going to get into right. that. But I'm sure you've been <laughs> having yes. so many interviews about yes. this. But, but, but listen to this. So, mm -hmm. so ESCOM, ESCOM sales rooms are going down. If you put pension funds, pension uh, workers' money in there, it's never coming back. Any lender that gives you the money is never coming back. The only way ESCOM has decided to has, has decided to respond to it, uh, besides running away like uh, like FISO, besides running away like Jawu Mabuza, is to increase the tariff by a minimum of 12 cents year on year. Now, ESCOM sales volumes, uh, ESCOM price tariffs mm -hmm. between 2007 and 2019 has increased by 446 percent against cumulative inflation of 98%. You want to continue to increase it by 12%, you are mad. Basically, you are mad. Besides being mad, the consequences of that is that electricity is not priced in elastic. It used to be, it's not. Mm. So the more you increase your tariff by 12% year on year, me and you put solar panels. The, the mines and the manufacturers invest in other technologies other than electricity and what does it do to your sales decline it will decline by more than one percent mm. so basically this business called escom has no future so the, the, we, we, we want to delve into the governance of ESCOM. You say yes. you want to touch a bit of that. Right. You having been at the helm of ESCOM and uh, the issue of uh, ESCOM being captured and then all these people that are being brought in to then clean it, up, clean it up that we're seeing then all of a sudden saying, look, I'm not going to be sticking around for this and, and leaving. And you have these practical examples of how ESCOM could have possibly and can still perhaps possibly get out of this, this quagmire. Um, what, what's your comment with regards so to that? For the longest time we've been told uh, the Guptas, <coughs> you know, yes. uh, we, we're feeling the, uh, the repercussions of uh, the Guptas and the capturing state, um, that yes. state-owned uh, yes. enterprise in particular. So, so before I answer your question, let me preface it and say the discussion is not about ESCOM. Mm -hmm. The discussion is about energy security in 10 years' time, in 20 years' time. That's the only preoccupation I have. ESCOM is behind me. Even if I get order offered a billion rands, I will not go back to ESCOM. You have come to peace with that. I've come back. To, I've come to peace with that. So mm. it's all about how do we create energy security that is decarbonized, that is cost effective, that can support economic growth in the next twenty years. That's the only reason I'm involved in this discussion, mm. right? But when you do that, you must accept that ESCOM in South Africa generates ninety-five percent of the electricity. So it's a bigger part of the equation. It's, in, it's not possible to have a conversation about energy security in 50 years' time without... Looking back at what happened. Without looking mm. back at, at, at what happens. In 2015, <coughs> the, the way you conceptualize ESCOM problem can lead you to the solutions quickly or you never get to the solution. And I think 
for obvious, for deliberate reasons, government's conceptualization of the ESCOM problem is misplaced. And I, th I think they do so deliberately so that they can make their independent power producers happier. I mean independent power producer. So, so it's not about the independent power producers that is not right, it's the design right. of, of the independent power producer mm -hmm. that, that is not done. So in 2014-2015, we conceptualized the, the problem. And um, I always credit Brian for that. And if you, if you see what's the problem of ESCOM today, ESCOM has got an 80 billion rand problem that it has no control of. And that 80 billion rand problem that it has no control of, it's increasing by 20% every year. If you want to, have a, to quantify it and have a feel of it, it, it it's, it's the, you, you, the, you must then say ESCOM spends 145 billion rands mm -hmm. a year. It's spending 145 billion rands a year, and it's got 80 billion rands of that 145 billion rands. That is increasing by 20% year and year, and it has no control over it. It's a holy cow. And that, that, 80 that sounds billion very disturbing. That's, and, and that's a conversation that people are not having it. And as soon as the Dabeng was going to the ESCOM board and see it, they can run. They run. You can only run. You can't solve this problem. Because when you, the only way to solve it is to is not to have holy cows. And the holy the the, the eighty billion rand problem I'm talking about, fifty five billion rands of it. You know, fifty eight billion rands of it. Fifty eight billion rands of it. Fifty eight point mm. three billion rands of it to be exact. It's coal. Twenty two billion rands of it is the independent power producers. To solve the ESCOM problem, you must solve that eighty billion rands problem. But government and, and, and government and ESCOM board has no proverbial balls to sit the ESCOM coal suppliers down and say it is wrong that your costs are increasing by 14 percent year on year, but my regulated tariff is increasing by 8 percent. Mm. It's wrong. And these are suppliers that have been there since the beginning of time, really. This is the suppliers that have been there for quite some time. Mm. Uh, I mean, the, 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 the most offending of them all is Tlenko. Tlenko is selling ESCOM coal at the price of 1,000 rands per ton. The same coal ESCOM is selling is buying from small black suppliers mm -hmm. at 400, 400 rands per ton. It's criminal. And ESCOM just does not have the balls. That's incomprehensible. To say to Tlenko, I will not pay you 1,000 rands per ton. And this is information that you know factually? It's in the yearbooks. It's in the yearbooks. It's in the yearbooks. Mm. I mean, it's, 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 it's there for everyone it's to see. It's there for everybody to see. Right. And, and those that don't read the yearbooks, I always tweet it and give them reference to go mm -hmm. and find it. So it's not a secret information. Yeah, it's, it's in Parliament. It's not information you're generating from, no, from somewhere. No, no, no. I just know it. Mm -hmm. It's in my blood. Talk to us about the nuclear right. power program and how it fits into all of this, if it only does. So do you understand the 80 billion rands problem? Yes. That unless yes. ESCOM solves the 80 billion rands problem. It sounds insurmountable when you, <laughs> when you hear that, that huge amount. It's, 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 going to, it's going to die. ESCOM has got a nuclear business called Kubek. Mm. The nuclear business of ESCOM has been there for over 45 years. Um, it's, it, 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 it's highly regulated and have got a very strong oversight. And that oversight comes from two organizations internationally, uh, Independent IMPO and uh, WANO, World Association of Nuclear Operators. They come, WANO comes to Cuba and they audit it and they give them a rating. Mm. In the history of Kuber, in the history of ESCOM, the best w uh, peer review rating was received in 2017, January. Right. And that is the year that everybody locates as the year of state capture. So you would have expected that in the year of state capture, 
the peer review that is done by people that are not involved will rate the ESCOM nuclear business worse. Mm. Because by definition, state capture should diminish ESCOM business. State capture by definition hollows out, hollows, hollows out, I think is the right yes, term. Yes, that's correct. Hollows mm. out skilled people mm. and replaces them with incompetent, pliable people mm. who can run the business. So you'd expect that um, during the year of state capture, Kubek's performance would be worse. But I put it to you Logically. Mm. that the best ever one rating came in the time of state capture. So when I joke to my kids, I say, but state capture was good for ESCO. <laughs> because every technical indicator, every single, I mean, I'm not joking here, mm -hmm. every single technical indicator of ESCOM between 2001 and 2017, 2018, the best was in those years, 2015, 2016, 2017. The coal prices of ESCO was the lowest 2015, 2016, 2017. Now you'd expect that state capture mm -hmm. involves taking business from Tienko, taking business from uh, Arnott Exaro, you give it to the Guptas at a, at a officially high price. Right. And when you, s when you look at the prices of coal in the years the Guptas were, here, were there, those prices would be up. Now, if you go and read, again, the ESCOM yearbook, mm. it's opposite. The ESCOM coal prices were the cheapest in the years that are described. So essentially, all this information is at the tips of our, of our fingertips. If we're to just read and see the information of that is presented, the, then the narrative would not be so much as what we've been made but, to but believe over the years. That is why the investigators, including the Zondo commissions, have got difficulty in this state capture theory. Because in joining the dots, so in joining the dots, because w uh, um, the beauty part of the of, of the Zondo Commission is that it follow is called competent judge is a is led by a competent judge. I mm. disagree with those that uh, label Ch Chief Justice Zondo differently. Very competent, amazing, impeccable men of the uh, 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 silk uh, mm. competent lawyers. They don't read business day and make conclusions. They follow the evidence wherever the evidence leads them to. Mm. And I can tell you they have a difficulty because the evidence is leading them elsewhere. The evidence simply says ESCOM was the best. During that period? During that period. And then it doesn't make sense because the narrative has been the opposite. And it does not make sense. To the, uh, I am not saying mm -hmm. there was no criminals within ESCOM. It's a different conversation. In fact, I am the only one who reported the criminals and they arrested in December 2019. Yes, we remember that. I gave the pride people the evidence. I gave the board the evidence. I said, they are thieves at Kosile. They are thieves at Midupi. Here's the evidence. I was suspended for that. But you know, truth... Ultimately, you resigned. Ultimately, but... But it's important to say mm -hmm. I was suspended for saying this corruption at Kusile, and I gave the evidence. It is that evidence that led to the arrest of the people. So when I say ESCOM was the best, I'm not saying there was no corruption. I still, there's still more corruption that must be dealt with. I mean, when the CEO get cancelled for conflict of interest, then that's you, something to say. Yes. Then, then, then we have a problem. So, so Kubel, ESCOM has got a very competent nuclear business. If you are interested in stable, decarbonized electricity in 50 years' time, you will make nuclear part of your mix. There's no other way. Um, the only risk you must deal with is that the years of building big coal stations, mm -hmm. big nuclear are gone. So, so the opportunity is inflexible modular power plants, what we call high temperature modular reactors. And if, if, if I had the 
ear of the Minister of Energy, which I don't, I would say to him, South Africa must commit to a high temperature modular reactor by the end of this decade. Because once you, and, 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 and the logic that says nuclear is expensive will not hold, because in 2010, we built wind and we built solar that was not cost effective. Mm. It was exp if we take the, if we took the same logic today with in, tw we, 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 in 2010, we would not have built nuclear. Uh, we would not have built wind. We would not have built too. solar. So the country must commit to a modular high temperature reactor by the end of the decade. The importance of that mm. is this. Um, I don't, the scope of clean coal technologies only excites those that are not active in the field. Now, I cut my teeth as a, I'm a chemical engineer, I cut my teeth as a combustion engineer. Mm -hmm. The combustion of coal for nuclear generation is my speciality. I was the special, ESCOM most senior specialist in coal combustion. Right. So, and I served internationally in many of these coal research facilities. I don't see the scope of clean coal technology emerging and being reliable in the next 10 to 20 years. Mm. I don't. Mm. And that's because I know it. You can call me arrogant, you can call me names. Um, should the messenger, I give you a tissue, you can cry. Right. Are you know. speaking from an informed position? Yes. Mm. So the scope lies in high temperature reactors that are modular. And once you qualify them and you certify them and they are proven, you can then go to the old power stations in the high field. And then you can replace them with this high temperature modular reactor mm. in, in, in Weedbank, in middle in, in Middleburg, wherever you have these old stations. Then you are beginning to give hope to those communities. But much more than that, I did the study and we've concluded and published this, the results that says nuclear has got better multiplier effect in the economy than any other generation technology. Okay. That's been proven. Yes. Yeah, the numbers mm -hmm. are there. So so you 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 then are uh, you taking your capital, you are investing it appropriately. But you're also decarbonizing the electricity, mm. but you're also providing a signal in the future that you're gonna have security of supply. Right. So the time is now. There's no other time. Mm. My, you see, you see, the other frustrations that I had, uh, that I have, is that I was very young in ESCOM in the 90s, late 90s, when we told government that in, 20, in 2007 you're going to run out of picking capacity, in 2010 you're going to run out of base load capacity. So you have the foresight even back then. We are engineers. Mm -hmm. Th that's why we are engineers. If engineers, mm -hmm. if your engineers cannot give you that foresight, then you've got the wrong engineers. And, and the, the problem I have today is that the discussion and the debate is led by non-engineers mm. that do not have the foresight, mm. that are easily lo lobbied by engineers, who, by engineers in the private sector who have turned lobbyists. Now, one of the dangerous things that you can ever have is to have an engineer who, gets, who becomes a lobbyist because it's no longer objective. Right. But we... In the engineering field, we're not surprised that we ran out of capacity in 2007 and we started load shedding in 2007. We're not surprised that we ran out of base, base load capacity. And the consequences of that is, 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 is we live with today. Mm. Former President Beggy was the only polite politician who said ESCOM was right and we were wrong. The rest of us say, Cyril was there, you never say it. <laughs> but he knows it. That was 1997 when we've seen the consequences of it today. Mm -hmm. My biggest fear is that we, history so repeat itself. is repeating itself. We're going to sit in 2030. So whatever is happening now, nothing surprises you about no, that? No, it happened in, right? in 1997. Mm -hmm. uh, you see, the energy policy is politicized. There's just too, there's too many lobbyists here. And nobody is prepared to say, Take the lobby, take the politics out of this thing. 
let's just protect. But as a state-owned enterprise, I mean, trying to take politics out of it really would be almost impossible. No, no but the, the, this state-owned enterprise is condemned. I, I, just, I, I, I started showing you yes. that its sales volumes are declining. Mm. There's no future in the state-owned company. Mm. The, I write in my opinion piece that the ministerial determination that was issued by Minister Mantasha in 2020 mm -hmm. of 13,800 megawatts excludes ESCOM up to 2027. But the independent, but the, but the integrated resource plan says 12,000 ESCOM of ESCOM cap capacity will be decommissioned. So you are decommissioning 12,000 megawatts of ESCOM. Mm -hmm. You are replacing it with 13,800 of uh, uh, th that is in the current two ministerial determinations, 2,000 of that, 2,000 megawatt between 2022, 2024, and between 2024 to 2027 is 11,800. You've excluded ESCOM there. So 12,000 of, uh, 12, of ESCOM get decommissioned. You are building 13,800 megawatt, you exclude ESCOM. Mm -hmm. Its sales continue to decline by 1%, uh, uh, even more. So. There is, however you look at it, there is no future. And if you are a decent board member of ESCOM, you'll jump ship. So, so this state-owned entity of, you're talking about is condemned, and it's condemned by its owner. There's something that the ANC Lukota has come up with and say we will build a, we will set up a new state-owned company that is not ESCOM. The unbundling of the of, of ESCOM, that also is not something that you think was a good idea. No, is that it's, 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 a, it's a wasteful discussion to have. Mm. Because even if you get it right, you're not solving the 80 billion, and pro 80 mm. billion and problem. So that is the crux of the problem right there. If that yeah. cannot be resolved, this yes. is not going so anywhere. That, it, you know, Which is impossible. I, I, I hardly participate in the, mm. in the debate and conversation mm. of unbundling. Because it's, it's, it's very far away from the ESCOM actual problem. Mm. The only reason the unbundling is very important is the transmission company that will be taken out of ESCOM and has got what we call systems and market operator whose purpose will be to build more renewable, uh, more IPPs. That's, that's the only important thing. But ESCOM problem is the 80 billion problem that is increasing by 20% and it's sales that are declining, which unbundling discussion doesn't touch. So right. if I have to sit okay. with you now oh, yeah. and, have a, and have a discussion with mm. you and you put the, uh, uh, unbundling of ESCOM, I say, you're wasting my time. Mm. That's not where the problem, uh, ESCOM problem is. And ESCOM knows it. I can tell you now. ESCOM knows it. And the people that are driving this uh, uh, unbundling, they know it, that the, the solution of ESCOM does not lie in unbundling. The solution of ESCOM lies in the 80 billion rand problem, which is made up of 58 billion rands of coal costs, mm -hmm. 22 billion rands of independent po producer costs, that is increasing both of them by 20% year on year, plus ESCOM sales, which will continue to decline because they've allowed the mines to self-generate and they've allowed the municipalities that can afford to self-generate. ESCOM is left with municipalities that can't afford. But here's my challenge to you, Mr. Koko. You have all this knowledge and expertise. You've had the experience of working there. If, if you're going to say that, you know, it makes sense for an executive to, to leave, you know, it's actually more respectable to do that. Who's supposed to solve this problem? Well, I mean, in the spirit of, of being patriotic and wanting to build a South Africa yeah, for patriot, all. Patriotic works for others. I think it's, it's a cliche when you talk about patriotic. I had my country duty for the last 33 years. My association with ESCOM is over 33 years. I've done the best that I can, and if you go to ESCOM, people, they will tell you the best that I've done. And I can tell you now, my best is a benchmark now. I've done my share. I have a, I, in, the, in that 33 million, in that 33 years, I looked at South African market of now 55 million people. I have a much higher energy now that looks at the market of 600 million people. You're not going to get me back into ESCOM. But ESCOM people, let me tell you, are very competent people. ESCOM is men and women that pound for pound are par excellence. 
the people who stopped load shedding when I was there, they are still there. So ESCOM is not run, it's not short of skills. ESCOM is not short of skills so to justify the importation of German engineers. No, an average ESCOM engineer is 15 years. Very competent. Mm. If, you, if you look at them in an international part of platform, you will be proud of ESCOM engineers. That's not the way the problem is. Government is a problem. Anybody that goes into ESCOM, however best, will fail because it's constrained. The environment is not conducive for them to exactly. rise to the occasion. You'll fail. Whether you bring Brian Molefe back, it can succeed here and there. Mm. But, but not optimally. Government policy has condemned ESCOM. Mm. That's where the problem is. I suppose we'll have to end it there, we're running out of time. And in this uh, opinion piece you end with saying the electricity policy is clearly not coordinated, the centre is not holding, it is an amorphous mess. That's what it is, it's an amorphous mess. Well, thank you for speaking to us, Mr. Koko. We certainly appreciate it. You're welcome. And to thank your you. viewers at home uh, for taking part in the conversation, we certainly appreciate it. Uh, you can keep the comments, uh, the comments coming. I see that you've been a part of this conversation. We certainly appreciate it at GUN underscore TV underscore and our Facebook page, uh, Galaxy Universal Network as well. We'll have to leave it there for now. Just stay with us. At the top of the hour, we return with more news and updates from across the continent. The power to defeat coronavirus is in our hands. Play your part by following these five basic precautions. Regularly wash your hands with soap and water or sanitizer for at least 20 seconds. Maintain a safe distance of at least one and a half meters from people around you. Wear a cloth mask at all times when in public. Always cough or sneeze into your elbow or tissue. If you're an employer, screen your employees daily for symptoms of COVID-19 and where appropriate, refer for testing. Working together, we can beat the coronavirus. A message from government. Feel the heat. I love Adam Selman. The girls are really thin. I think it looks very glamorous from the outside. The life of a model in New York City. There is such cool prints. So many. You know, I'm buying this. Look at me and all the selfie sort of thing. Honestly, I didn't really know that was actually a job. It just didn't occur to me. Congratulations. Feel the excitement. Feel the heat with Starset. Feel the heat. Just watch this. Let the pictures tell you everything. the excitement that was delightful feel the heat with starset feel the heat chicken portions are an easy way to feed a crowd i've just started to incorporate all my ingredients we're going to put this inside of a hot cast iron skillet you want to really fill up on great protein it's now time to sample the chef's dish mm -hmm. look at this i know like that Feel the excitement. Michigan is on the spot. Feel the heat with Starset. Feel the heat. The day will come when these measures are no longer needed. Until then, however, we must ensure that all our people receive adequate support. We look ahead to a better future. I have faith in the strength and the resilience of ordinary South Africans who have proven time and time again throughout our history that they can rise to any challenge that is presented to our country.
We shall recover. We shall overcome. the heat. Just watch this. Let the pictures tell you everything. Feel the heat. Chicken portions are an easy way to feed a crowd. I've just started to incorporate all my ingredients. We're going to put this inside of a hot cast iron skillet. You want to really fill up on great protein. It's now time to sample the chef's dish. Mm -hmm. Look at this. I know. Like that? Feel the excitement. The chicken is on the spot. Feel the heat with Stossa. Now, warm uh, welcome back to Galaxy Prime. Thank you for staying with us. Now, before we hit the top of the hour, we thought we'd bring you the story of uh, fewer than 100 people that have died of COVID-19 in Somalia. The healthcare system, uh, system has been devastated by three decades of conflict. Now, we look into the reality of uh, the coronavirus in the country. We follow two young doctors in the fight of their lives. Here's a report. In Somalia's capital, Mogadishu, two doctors are in the fight of their lives. There is an intensive care unit serving COVID-19 patients, just 20 beds for a population of 16 million. Officially, less than 100 Somalis have died from COVID-19. But the graveyards are filling up fast. BBC Africa Eye goes in search of the truth behind the official death figures. How is the country with one of the world's weakest health systems really coping with the COVID-19 outbreak? Somalia's fragile government is bracing itself for the worst. The first COVID-19 case is reported in mid-March. There are fears that many more will fall victim to the virus. Martini, one of the country's oldest hospitals, is designated by the government to treat patients. These are the doctors who have volunteered to work on the front lines. By mid-April, Dr. Hilwa and Dr. Abdeladif are working round the clock to treat COVID-19 patients. Then, you know, I to go but behind the masks, doctors despair at the inferior medical equipment they have to work with. <laughs> Without a 
a functioning ventilator, the doctors lose their battle to keep this patient alive. People are dying of COVID-19 in the Martini Hospital, but on the streets of Mogadishu, normal life goes on. The government is advising people to stay at home during the day, but few here can afford to follow that advice. And as the holy month of Ramadan begins, mosques remain open across Somalia. Some worshippers believe their faith will form a shield. Some here may be resigned to the will of God. But ambulances continue to rush COVID victims to the Martini Hospital. This lady, Mama Fadumo, has been unwell with COVID-19 symptoms for more than a week now. As in the rest of the world, old age makes her more vulnerable to the virus. Officially, fewer than 100 people have died of COVID-19 in Somalia. But Dr. Hilwa knows that the real number is much higher because many people, even those who are seriously ill, refuse to come here. Images from one of Mogadishu's main cemeteries, Barakat, support Dr. Hilwa's belief that many COVID-19 deaths are going unrecorded. Back in January, this was empty land. Now it's a large-scale cemetery. This is just one of several cemeteries in Mogadishu that have been filling up fast. There is no way of verifying, but from the evidence we gathered, it seems COVID-19 could now be one of the biggest killers in Somalia. The deceased, like many, displayed symptoms of COVID-19, but died without ever going to hospital. Despite the fear that surrounds Martini, Dr. Hilwa and her colleagues are saving many lives. Mama Fadumo has recovered and is going home. Her son Yahya has come to collect her. Tragically, after decades of conflict, death is all too familiar to Somalis. This time, however, the killer is silent. But Dr. Hilwa and Dr. Abdul Ladif have not given up on their patients or on their country, Somalia. Now uh, we go to uh, one of our top stories. Uh, actually, we'll just go through our headlines. Our former South African police minister today gave testimony at uh, the Zonder Commission. Also, an internet blackout after Somalia's prime minister is removed and ousted president seeks a re-election in the Central African Republic. 
We'll also have a look at South Africa's economic recovery plan and a, Zambia mem a Zambian member of parliament with HIV tests uh, COVID-19 positive. These are some of the stories that we'll be bringing you in our headlines. Now, those stories in detail, lawyers uh, for former police minister Nkosinati Nkleko have complained about the no-show of former independent police investigative directorate head, uh, that's Robert McBride, before the Zondo Commission, where he was said to be cross-examined on the evidence that he gave to the inquiry, which implicate, implicated in Tleko. Tleko took the stand at the commission to answer to some of the allegations in which he was implicated by witnesses. And um, the Tleko's lawyers, advocate William Mugari, said that a former minister's team was disappointed that McBride's failure to appear before the commission as it had made necessary preparations to quiz him on the allegations that he had made. Last year, McBride told the commission that uh, Gosinatin Tleko had suspended him in 2015 over the IPIDS report on the Zimbabwean renditions saga, which also saw the former Hawks boss, Anwar Dramat, and uh, Khartoum counterpart, Shadrach Sibia, being suspended from their post. Now, the saga related um, to this uh, was uh, spoken about in detail by the former police minister. Let's take a listen to this. On operational issues, it was also this issue of uh, the rendition of uh, the Zimbabwean, the Zimbabwean national. The third area that was quite prominent in the <clears throat> in the now the, the renditions of the Zimbabwean national. Let me just if you just take a step back. <clears throat> it's a matter that even before I came in, it was in the public domain. I think there was an expose by the Sunday Times. The criminal justice cluster at the time also even issued a statement in this regard. Advocate Musing in the in the in the work that Vexman eventually did uh, within you know of, of the national prosecuting authority also does refer to a meeting of top management there being addressed by the then minister of uh, justice and constitutional development specifically also about this particular matter and so on so <clears throat> it was it was really a matter that was uh, uh, out there in the in the public domain now on crime intelligence, uh, I think in my first week or two, when when I was there, there was there were a lot of things that came out of the, the Sunday newspapers pertaining to crime intelligence and uh, some of the issues that were <clears throat> that were also happening there. But one area of my major interest also was the question of the perpetual uh, suspension of Mr. Richard Mulwood. Now. You, you, you will appreciate, Che, in terms of the background that I gave, you know, a, which is a, a background in trade unionism, industrial relations, and whatever and so on, that <clears throat> certainly it is something that, from a labor relations point of view, you have to be concerned about somebody who's sitting at home and is not being utilized effectively for for for, for, for the intended goals or for the intention the institute. Still in South Africa, President Cyril Ramaphosa has warned of a long and difficult recovery from uh, the decline in economic activity caused by the coronavirus pandemic. In his weekly newsletter, he warned the country's unemployment rate of 30 percent will soon increase. The president said the government is finalizing an economic recovery program whose main aim is to protect and to create jobs. He said the creation of jobs are for people that add value to their communities through maintenance and uh, care work and other services keeps people engaged in productive activity and it also helps them to retain and to develop skills. He promises that they will do whatever they can to build an economy that is resilient and dynamic, that creates work and opportunity, that meets the needs of all the people of South Africa. The country has to date confirmed 445,433 coronavirus cases, the highest in Africa and the fifth highest globally after the United States, Brazil, India and Russia.
In an almost unanimous vote of no confidence over the weekend, saw Somalia's prime minister being removed from his post as he had been condemned inside and outside the country. The European Union Foreign Policy Chief Joseph Borrell said the move against Hassan Ali Kaira shows a serious disrespect for the constitutional foundations of Somalia, while the internal security minister called it a dark day for the country. Internet access was cut across much of the country and uh, this uh, saw the monitors also struggling to locate uh, which uh, of uh, the internet uh, freedoms that they could actually go with. They said the ongoing incident uh, has high impact that is consistent with an international blackout and is not attributed to any of the international issues. The vote to remove Kaire, which was backed by 170 out of 178 members of parliament, follows a power struggle between himself and President Mohamed Abdullahi Mohamed. And over the timing of the next uh, presidential election, this has been heightened by the tensions. The removed prime minister has said the vote uh, must be held in February 2021 as scheduled. But the president has insisted that it should only go ahead if it's held on a one-person, one-vote basis. Currently in Somalia, clans uh, select members of parliament who, turn, who in turn select the president. And uh, such a change would then be impossible within the given time frame because it would require a vaster resources and a mass voter registration. Now, until a new prime minister is appointed, the deputy prime minister has been asked uh, by the president to act as the caretaker. We go to the Central African Republic now with former President Francois Bozizé, who was ousted by rebels in 2013, is to stand again in December's elections. His bid was announced on Saturday. It is seen as a high risk given the country's lingering civil unrest, but it is not expected. Bozizé first took power in the country following a coup in 2003, winning two subsequent elections that were widely seen as fraudulent. The current president, Faustin Toadera, is expected to stand for re-election at the polls through his candidacy, and it has not yet been officially announced. We'll bring you an update with regards to that story as soon as we have more. For now, we'll take a very short break. This is Galaxy Prime. Stay with us. The power to defeat coronavirus is in our hands. Play your part by following these five basic precautions. Regularly wash your hands with soap and water or sanitizer for at least 20 seconds. Maintain a safe distance of at least one and a half meters from people around you. Wear a cloth mask at all times when in public. Always cough or sneeze into your elbow or tissue. If you're an employer, screen your employees daily for symptoms of COVID-19 and where appropriate, refer for testing. Working together, we can beat the coronavirus. A message from government. Feel the heat. I love Adam Selman. The girls are really thin. I think it looks very glamorous from the outside. The life of a model in New York City. There is such cool prints. So many. You know, I'm buying this. Look at me and all the selfie sort of thing. Honestly, I didn't really know that was our job. It just didn't occur to me. Congratulations. Feel the excitement. Feel the heat with Starset. Feel the heat. Just watch this. Let the pictures tell you everything. the excitement that was delightful feel the heat with starset feel the heat chicken portions are an easy way to feed a crowd 
I've just started to incorporate all my ingredients. We're gonna put this inside of a hot cast iron skillet. You wanna really fill up on great protein. It's now time to sample the chef's dish. Mm -hmm. Look at this. I know. Like that? Feel the excitement. The chicken is on the spot. Feel the heat with Starset. Feel the heat. Feel the heat with Starset. The day will come when these measures are no longer needed. Until then, however, we must ensure that all our people receive adequate support. We look ahead to a better future. I have faith in the strength and the resilience of ordinary South Africans who have proven time and time again throughout our history that they can rise to any challenge that is presented to our country. We shall recover. We shall overcome. Welcome back to Galaxy Prime. Now in breaking news, just coming in, the spokesperson to the president of South Africa, Kuzela Diko, has taken leave of absence and will temporarily relinquish her roles in the government. This is coming from a Facebook page, her official Facebook page, where she is announcing that this is pending the outcome of investigations into the awarding of two subsequently cancelled contracts for the supply of personal protective equipment to Royal Baka Projects, a company in which her husband is a director. The presidency today confirmed that uh, Ms. Decock formally made uh, the request to leave of absence to the minister in the presidency, uh, that's Mr. Jackson Mtembu, and uh, she says, and I quote, I, I wish to thank the presidency for timelessly uh, acceding to my request. It is of the utmost importance that the work of the presidency and the government as a whole is not undermined or adversely impacted by these allegations, especially at the time when our nation's focus is on battling the COVID-19 pandemic, end of quote. Now, the presidency has uh, appointed Mr. Tyrone Siele to act uh, in the position of spokesperson to the president during this time. If you have just joined us, breaking news coming in there, the presidency's spokesperson, Kusela Diko, has uh, taken leave of absence. On to our other stories now, Zim a Zambian Member of Parliament, uh, Princess Kasune Zulu, who's living with HIV and is a prominent AIDS activist, has announced that she has tested positive for COVID-19. Zulu, a member of the Opposition United Party for National Development, was tested last Thursday. Members of Parliament have so far tested positive for COVID-19, according uh, to the Health Minister. Parliamentary sittings have been indefinitely suspended in Zambia. Zulu says she's not surprised by the test results, uh, partly because Zambia's parliament had initially continued holding sittings despite the rise in the coronavirus numbers instead of carrying on business from home via virtual systems. She is also blaming the lack of adhering to guidelines and the politicization of COVID-19 and uh, the lack of leadership at this critical time that has fueled the surge in the, of, in the coronavirus in Zambia. She further encourages people with existing health conditions to adhere to medication. Zambia has so far reported 4,481 cases of coronavirus and 139 deaths. Now, fewer than 100 people have died of COVID-19 in Somalia. The healthcare system has been devastated by three decades of conflict. We take a look into the reality of the coronavirus in Somalia. We follow two young doctors who are in the fight of their lives. Here's a report from Somalia. Hello, 
welcome. Ah, pleasure to see you here. Very good to see you. How are you? I'm very well. Always, always a pleasure to come here. Sorry, it's oh, my pleasure. Good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you for welcoming me. Oh, for the Peace Forum. For the Peace Forum. Is it? <laughs> it's it? But it's going to take a bit of time for before the... In Somalia's capital, Mogadishu, two doctors are in the fight of their lives. <laughs> There is an intensive care unit serving COVID-19 patients, just 20 beds for a population of 16 million. Officially, less than 100 Somalis have died from COVID-19. But the graveyards are filling up fast. <laughs> BBC Africa Eye goes in search of the truth behind the official death figures. How is the country with one of the world's weakest health systems really coping with the COVID-19 outbreak? Somalia's fragile government is bracing itself for the worst. The first COVID-19 case is reported in mid-March. There are fears that many more will fall victim to the virus. Martini, one of the country's oldest hospitals, is designated by the government to treat patients. These are the doctors who have volunteered to work on the front lines. By mid-April, Dr. Hilwa and Dr. Abdeladif are working round the clock to treat COVID-19 patients. Then, you know, I to go but behind the masks, doctors despair at the inferior medical equipment they have to work with. <laughs> Without a functioning ventilator, the doctors lose their battle to keep this patient alive. People are dying of COVID-19 in the Martini Hospital, but on the streets of Mogadishu, normal life goes on. The government is advising people to stay at home during the day, but few here can afford to follow that advice. <laughs> And as the holy month of Ramadan begins, mosques remain open across Somalia. Some worshippers believe their faith will form a shield. Some here may be resigned to the will of God. Ambulances continue to rush COVID victims to the Martini Hospital. This lady, Mama Fadumo, has been unwell with COVID-19 symptoms for more than a week now. As in the rest of the world, old age makes her more vulnerable to the virus.
هذا وحسمينه يا توتال لمشهد اسبتال كده تكلمتين Officially, fewer than 100 people have died of COVID-19 in Somalia. But Dr. Hilwa knows that the real number is much higher because many people, even those who are seriously ill, refuse to come here. Images from one of Mogadishu's main cemeteries, Barakat, support Dr. Hilwa's belief that many COVID-19 deaths are going unrecorded. Back in January, this was empty land. Now, it's a large-scale cemetery. This is just one of several cemeteries in Mogadishu that have been filling up fast. <laughs> وحد وغاني ساحد مئنا حلق بودي مشير مئنا لفضل إيو إيو هو غاي مراي ساحد و و يا أها بشي هرا There is no way of verifying but from the evidence we gathered it seems COVID-19 could now be one of the biggest killers in Somalia The deceased like many displayed symptoms of COVID-19, but died without ever going to hospital. Despite the fear that surrounds Martini, Dr. Hilwa and her colleagues are saving many lives. Mama Fadumo has recovered and is going home. Her son Yahya has come to collect her. Hospital Martini, I can see him. Mel that can look at show. I'm a mel that can make a look at show. Or meet her look at. What is Hospital Casas Mahan? It's vital to have a wife and a wife. How do you have a wife? Want to force or hang a wife? The Americans for had to handle it. In a nerve, but bad in a in a wife. Come on, tragically, after decades of conflict, that is all too familiar to Somalis. This time, however, the killer is silent. But Dr. Hilwa and Dr. Abdul Adif have not given up on their patients or on their country, Somalia. And uh, for, with that, we'll take a very short break here on Galaxy Primer. Thank you for staying with us. More news and updates after this. The power to defeat coronavirus is in our hands. Play your part by following these five basic precautions. Regularly wash your hands with soap and water or sanitizer for at least 20 seconds. Maintain a safe distance of at least one and a half meters from people around you. Wear a cloth mask at all times when in public. Always cough or sneeze into your elbow or tissue. If you're an employer, screen your employees daily for symptoms of COVID-19 and where appropriate, refer for testing. Working together, we can beat the coronavirus. A message from... Hello. Being a legal practitioner in South Africa in these challenging times demands lawyers that will help clients beyond legal issues. The ever-changing demands in commerce and tourism require lawyers who have sound and clear business and commercial knowledge. And that's where MB Chava Incorporated comes in. Our business, mining, tourism, health, labor, and economic knowledge encapsulated with law and litigation experience gives us an advantage in the legal sphere. Our experience in assisting businesses, government, and various industries with their needs puts us amongst the many progressive and striving law firms in South Africa. Now, to contact our attorneys for assistance with any of the mentioned fields and others, please call us on 012-341-4187 or send us an email on admin at chabanku.co.za and be Chabanku Incorporated, where problems meet solutions. Oh,